Hey guys, today we're talking about satiety. Which foods help us feel full with less calories? With fewer calories. Learn that one. A lot of you guys uh, corrected me. Thanks. It's a uh, English as a second language defect. Our guest is Dr. Andreas Anfeld, who is a medical doctor based in Sweden, and he has a deep interest in this topic. And he and his team came up with an algorithm to try to figure out how satiating each food is. And they developed an app that puts all of this together. The app is publicly available. I don't think it's entirely free. I think that there's like a trial period and then it's paid. I'm not directly involved with the app, so there's no financial ties between us. We discussed the science of satiety and how different foods and different diets can help us feel satiated and support our health. There seems to be this idea that really, really makes sense, which is that it's not just about one factor. Um, low carb, of course, fo of course, focuses on carbs and insulin. And uh, if you go on a vegan diet, you focus only on animal products. Someone else may focus only on ultra processed foods, trying to avoid them. But there seems actually to be several factors. What if you could take all that complexity and then still make it simple. So that's what Ted and I and some other people have been working on for years, really trying to build an algorithm that as accurately as possible, uh, predicts how satiating various foods are per calorie based on all these various factors. And then trying to match that to the existing randomized controlled trials primarily and, and, and match it to observational data secondarily. Um, so that it predicts the data we have as well as possible. They are protein percentage. Mm -hmm. So eating a higher percentage protein diet tends to lead to wanting to eat less. The second big one is uh, energy density. So less energy dense foods tend to lead to eating less. This also correlates quite well with ultra processed foods. They tend to be more concentrated energy where you have removed the water, made it, it also makes it more shelf stable, etc. So multiple reasons why ultra processed foods tend to be high energy, energy density. Uh, but that's the second one. And then the third one, which, which is also quite powerful, it seems, is this uh, hyper palatability concept or the sort of hedonic quality of food, which is kind of unique in the way that it's not one measurable unit. It's more like certain combinations of nutrients tend to lead to this. So, for example, fat and sugar together is far more addictive than uh, only sugar or only fat. So, for example, uh, eating pure sugar, kind of tasty perhaps, but uh, people usually don't go buy a bag of sugar and, and, eat, and eat in front of the TV without being able to stop themselves. But if you add fat to it, uh, like chocolate or ice cream or donuts, then it suddenly becomes almost irresistible. So uh, same thing with fat, of course. Uh, uh, fat may be a little bit rewarding, but nobody really binges on butter or olive oil. Uh, but again, if you combine fat and sugar together at a certain bliss point, then it becomes more and more irresistible. Uh, so that's one thing that uh, many people know about, of course, fat and sugar together. Interestingly, there seem to be a few others such as fat and salt together in certain concentrations are also very addictive in nature. So for example, salted nuts are far more addictive than unsalted nuts, which I think everybody's experienced. Salted potato chips, very addictive. So you can also have these combinations of not just sugar and fat together, but also starch, concentrated starch and fat together with salt. You have potato chips, for example, very, very uh, hedonic and uh, addictive in nature. So three main factors that we added fiber as a fourth, mm. the smallest one. What about texture? Do you find that that has a big effect? Because in general, mm -hmm. uh, I think most people refer to that as, as, as having a 
it's a it's a big factor in ultra processed foods as well. Finding these perfect textures, whether it's creamy or crunchy, all this stuff is a big yeah. factor. Yeah, we don't calculate that because, uh, well, first of all, I don't think it's such a big factor. Might be, but uh, uh, it might also be correlated quite a lot with the other ones. Uh, but the big factor, to be honest, I guess, is that uh, it's kind of hard to tease out from conventional nutrition information that uh, is easily available uh, from these foods. I mean, Potentially, we could estimate it using uh, AI today, probably, but uh, it would be a bit imperfect. Um, so, yeah, probably a smaller factor, I would say. Certainly interesting. Maybe something we would add, add to our scoring system in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have discussed it, actually, quite a lot with some people. And... and uh, <clears throat> One factor that seems to be very interesting is eating speed. Like yeah, foods that cause you to eat faster cause you to eat more. And uh, if you have foods that have a hard surface that you need to chew a lot, then you tend to eat less. Though these these things also do correlate quite a bit with these other factors. So I mean, everything is kind of a little bit a little bit correlated, I guess. We rank all commonly available foods from zero to 100. Zero is the lowest satiety per calorie, 100 is the highest. And uh, then we try to aspirationally put 50 at a sort of balanced midpoint where, again, aspirationally, a, a normal person under, under, under normal circumstances would, would get a normal weight and uh, metabolic health by eating around 50 on average. That's what we're trying to aim for. Mm -hmm. um, and then over 50 would be foods that can lead to yeah, being leaner, stronger. Uh, but if you go too high, you may become too lean and, uh, and not feel your best, right? You're, basically, if you're only eating spinach and egg whites, it would be extremely boring first, but you would also not get the energy you need. So you can actually go too high in this scale, mm -hmm. at least long term. Mm -hmm. And the goal would be to find a, a good balance for yourself in the middle somewhere. The three pillars, the protein, the energy density, and the fiber are very clear, very quantitative. But how do you calculate the hyperpalatability? Basically, you, you get the max hedonic score if you max out on these sort of combinations, like a very high percentage of sugar and fat together with not a lot of protein and pretty energy dense. Or if you have a high fat, high sodium food. Basically, these combinations. So if it's a food that is low in protein, for example, and very, very high in fat, that still doesn't get a high hedonic score. But if you have fat and carbs together, fat and sugar together, then it can get a high hedonic score. I think most people have experienced themselves that you had a big, big meal, you're full, but you get some ice cream, you can eat quite a lot more. Certainly you have space. <laughs> there is space for that. But there uh, is clearly an effect like that. Coming up with foods that are satiating and are filling and don't make you want to eat more is doable. But then how do you get somebody to stick to those? So how do you guys navigate that? Yeah, I mean, totally. The goal is, again, is not to go crazy and uh, eat uh, only skinless chicken breast and broccoli. That would be miserable. The goal is to find some sort of balance where you are a little bit higher on this calorie score than before. I mean, if your goal is to be a little bit leaner or a little bit more metabolically healthy, just get, uh, get a little bit higher and uh, and find ways to do that that are, are still enjoyable. It could be less added fats, uh, a bit more protein, a bit less pro uh, processed foods, a little bit less uh, refined carbohydrates, Basically, you have many, many levers to, to pull artificial sweeteners instead of sugar. It's uh, like low-hanging fruit, right? Not uh, drinking calories. I mean, there yeah. are many ways to do it that can still be enjoyable. Basically, if you ask me, I used to be a very low-carb guy, very um, keto for a long time. And, uh, and now I eat quite a bit more carbs, still low-carb, I guess, compared to the standard diet for sure, maybe half 
of what most people eat. But uh, now I don't eat as much fat. I eat more protein. I eat focusing on satiety instead. And for me, I would say it's a hundred times easier. Mm -hmm. But my results are at least as good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, of course, if you want the most uh, hedonic and addictive foods that you can find, then the standard American diet is perfect. Everything is hyper palatable and ultra processed and full of fat and salt and sugar. Yeah, it's kind of kind of hard to compete sometimes with with that sort of full on assault on the on the taste senses. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it's going to be less addictive than that. Yeah, but I think you can eat great foods that are slightly higher satiety. Yeah, I think that that's the key, right? Is to find this balance where it's it's satiating, it's filling without the excessive calories, but also something that you can stick to long term. Because there's the famous story of the of Walter Kempner's diet with with the, just the, the white rice and the the table. Oh, my God, he got people to lose weight, but then the the stories are that he had to whip his participants into compliance because nobody wanted to. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. No, I, I mean, for, uh, our approach basically try to make it as simple as possible. I mean, I love the title of your uh, YouTube uh, video, uh, YouTube channel, as you know, uh, making nutrition simple or nutrition make simple, made it simple. That's kind of what what we try to do for decades with uh, with Diet Doctor for low carb diets and now with Hava for for satiety, making it as simple and foolproof as, as possible. So with our app now, we have found a way to make uh, tracking and, and getting feedback on, on what you're eating uh, as simple as possible, I think. For me, the, the, the uh, uh, super mega cheat code is non-fat Greek yogurt. Some people may be eating regular yogurt or some sugar sweetened yogurt. And that uh, the satiety per calorie there is isn't so great. Maybe it's in the twenties or thirties. But if you go for Greek yogurt, which has a whole lot more protein, then you get up in the the sixties or seventies. And then if you go for the non-fat Greek yogurt, then it goes to eighty or eighty-five, and you can still have it uh, artificially sweetened if that's what you like. It can really, really taste excellent, but be super high satiety per calorie. So mm -hmm. cottage cheese also pretty damn high. So those are my secret cheat codes. I tend to put on some weight. If I, if I eat everything, then I would probably weigh 20, 30 pounds more, maybe 40, who knows? Uh, I used to be 20 pounds more, uh, but eating like this, I find it super, super easy to maintain my, my preferred weight. What are some of the foods that would rank really low? I mean, basically anything super ultra processed and super hedonic uh, ranks low. So, uh, fortunately, regular chocolate, <laughs> not great. Uh, everything, all, all candy and uh, donuts and uh, French fries and potato chips and those kind of foods, very, very, very low. I think the surprising thing coming from a low carb perspective is, is that added fats tend to be very low. Uh, because people who are uh, on a low carb approach, they often feel like, well, fats give you a lot of satiety, and they do. But the key point here is we're talking about satiety per calorie, and satiety per calorie is quite low. So, yes, you get a lot of satiety from butter. Let's say you have butter in your coffee, that's a lot of satiety, yes, but even more calories. <laughs> it's like, Okay, you, you got a lot of satiety, but you also got 5,000 calories. Maybe it's not a great deal. It's going to depend on the specifics, I guess. Uh, high fat, because high fat diets can be slimming if everything else is, is also in the right range. Sure. I mean, especially if they are also high in protein, which they tend to be. If you go on a low carb, high fat diet, it's actually often quite a bit higher in protein than a, a standard American diet. So it can absolutely work, but uh, going on a low carb, high protein diet might be even more effective. Mm -hmm. 
I think one one thing that I find a bit interesting because there are so different opinions about it, like fruit. To the low carb camp, they think that fruits are very bad for you because they are all carbs and they're going to make you gain weight. And then you go and ask a vegan and they say they are the best thing you could ever eat. They're perfect. And then you wonder, you know, who's right? If you look at our society approach, then it's actually somewhere in the middle, mm. which is perhaps what you would expect, right? It's uh, very low in protein, uh, but everything else is is very high. So, I mean, energy density is good. Fiber content is good. It's not it's not got any hedonic combinations. Uh, so, uh, fruit like apple, for example, might get a score of forty five, perhaps. So, pretty much in the in the center. Mm -hmm. So, uh, neither one had the right answer, perhaps. Uh, neither the low carbers or the vegans. It was in the middle. Uh, something that uh, people might be surprised about uh, granola. People think, oh, that's a health food. That should be great for you, right? But if your goal is weight loss, it's not so helpful because it's mostly just sugar and carbohydrates in a very energy dense format. So that would get a score of like 15 or 20 or something quite mm -hmm. low because it's so dehydrated. It's uh, concentrated. A Snickers bar, they claim that they are very satiating pretty much, right? If you're hungry, you should have a Snickers bar. It's got a score of zero. It's uh, fat and sugar in a very energy dense combination. So, I mean, of course you get satiety from it, but you also get a million calories. So mm -hmm. uh, it depends on what your goals are. It's not ideal for weight loss, that's for sure. One of the most common comments we get is this dichotomy. So some people will say, oh, that is the most satiating food. And somebody right below will say the exact opposite. That food doesn't satiate me at all. So it seems that there is enormous individual variability in terms of satiety as well. I was actually talking to Christopher Gardner some time back about exactly this. He says every year he pools his student class and he uses these examples of a bowl of oatmeal with berries. So it would be a more high carb, low fat food. And then the other would be like scrambled eggs with butter. And he says that his class is pretty much a 50-50 split. Some people would be really satiated with the oats, but not satiated with the eggs. And the other, the rest of the class, the, the other half is kind of inverted. Have you seen this individual variability? So I, would, uh, I would love to see an experiment to see if that's actually true. I think, uh, unfortunately, we are quite poor at predicting the satiety per calorie of, of something we eat. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we may have all kinds of ideas that may or may not be accurate. I know a lot of people who say that they get super satiated by drinking bulletproof coffee or, or you know, butter coffee. But, you know, our algorithm predicts it has very, very low satiety per calorie. I would love to see experimental evidence that there are people who could be satiated by that, for example, or or this uh, experiment that uh, Christopher Gardner kind of sets up here. I think that the, the evidence we have kind of points in the opposite direction. And, and Gardner did an interesting study uh, a few years back where they tried to predict based on people's insulin sensitivity, whether they would be doing well on a low carb diet or uh, or a low fat diet but you know none of these things that they set up uh, to test had any impact whatsoever uh, it just it just didn't work like that yeah. so what i would hypothesize if you ask me my guess is that uh, individual differences are primarily when it comes to preferences and when it comes to sort of addictive properties of food because addiction is something that builds up over time based on our on our habits. You don't get born addicted to a certain food. You sort of build up that sort of drive to eat it over time so that when we're adults, maybe some of us have a very hard time to not eat ice cream in front of us while other people may not care for as much. Uh, and the other person might be same thing with uh, salty foods or you know, potato chips, can't leave them. There are individual preferences, individual sort of differences to what we are addicted to. I think that's the biggest difference, if if I were to guess. But again, I, I would love to see experimental studies to 
confirm or deny this either way. What so do you think? I, I find it really difficult to deny that there is an, a, a big element of individual variability, but I don't know what's behind that. Is it a habit of eating certain foods? Is it something genetically determined? That I don't know. But for example, so so you were referring to diet fits, uh, the yeah. Stanford study, right? If I remember correctly, they had uh, the waterfall plots for those two diets. So the individual, uh, person by person, the results they had on low carb or low fat, right? And this is something that we see with almost all of these trials looking at low carb versus low fat. When you break it down person by person, you always see that some people lost weight, some people there was no clear difference, and some people gained. Yeah, but that's uh, that's observational, right? Um, that could be due to anything. It's not. Uh, it's not cause and effect. It's just. Uh, it could be anything. Uh, what you have to do is divide people in advance, right? Uh, which is what they did in, in diet phase. They looked at people who were insulin sensitive and who had these genes, right. or, or or not insulin sensitive and didn't have those genes. Uh, and there you had no uh, difference whatsoever. If you look at those waterfall plots, uh, I mean, there could be other differences, like maybe 50% of people were more inclined to go all in for this, and maybe they exercised more, or maybe they ate less ultra-processed uh, foods on the side. Who knows? I mean, it could be a million differences, right? Uh, it could be adherence. Yeah. It, it didn't really... Uh, it didn't show cause and effect that some people were doing better on low carb. Some people were doing better on, on low fat because of the diet. Yeah, the differences could be due to anything, right? Yes. I think it could be adherence. I think it would be an, an obvious. Uh, I mean, it could be a, a million things is my, sure. is my point. Sure. But it, but it, but it does, although it doesn't tell us exactly why, why people had these results. And I've, that's kind of my my big question mark is I don't know why we see this variation, but it does suggest that there's there are some people that are doing really well in this program with that diet, and there are others that are just not not doing well. Maybe because they eat those foods and they go, nah, this is not for me, and they stop adhering to the low carb diet or the low fat diet. Mm -hmm. So it absolutely it could be that uh, <clears throat> exactly. I mean that uh, that's very possible. It's very plausible, I think. So it would still, if that's the case, if it's a problem with adherence, it would still tell us that that diet doesn't work very well for this person um, because it's too hard for them to adhere. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, some people like to go on a low carb diet. Some people hate it because they they don't want to eat like that. I mean, and that that's obvious, right? That's that's. I don't think that's controversial. Right. Yeah. With and and I mean, all diets have this this problem. Or this feature of uh, of this individual variability that, unfortunately, no no one recipe works for everyone, so it makes it more complicated. No, no, and that's why it's beautiful with this satirical calorie approach because you can use that lens with any diet, low carb, high carb, or anything in between. You just rely on all these first principles that govern the satirical calorie of foods, and then basically you can eat whatever you like to eat, and then. This system can guide you to slightly more satiating versions of that. A sort of a devil's advocate would be that you could eat a diet that is very satiating, but isn't necessarily health promoting. It would be possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? <clears throat> yeah, of course, cyanide uh, is satiating perhaps, but not, not right. good for your health. I mean, there are all kinds of uh, uh, possibilities there. What I would... Uh, offer as a counterpoint is that arguably the biggest health problem in the world is, is poor metabolic health. It drives all the top chronic diseases that kill us, heart disease, cancer, dementia, stroke, uh, pretty much all of it. And 93% uh, of the adult US population have poor metabolic health. It's like the biggest health problem of our time. And this type of calorie approach arguably is tailored specifically to deal with that one biggest problem. Of course, if your problem is, is a peanut allergy, it's not going to help with that. Mm -hmm. But it, it does help with the biggest health problem in the world, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it would be an unfair criticism of the approach to say that it doesn't solve every problem. It's kind of, the, it's the nirvana fallacy. 
it can help solve one problem, which is yeah. arguably the biggest problem for Big problem. most people. Yeah. I think it's just, it's probably good to bear in mind as a user, good to bear in mind, it's solving the one problem, not every other problem. Absolutely, 100% agree. The water content of a food, but I guess that's, mm -hmm. it's, that's part of the energy density, right? Absolutely, that's uh, exactly what it is. That's the biggest factor in energy density is how much water does it have. Fiber and, and energy density are also kind of overlapped to some extent. They do overlap a bit. Yeah, absolutely. All of these overlap a bit, basically. Yeah. The more ultra-processed food is, on average, they tend to do worse on all of these factors. Yeah. Uh, but then again, like some people, I'm sure you've seen some people argue on X about uh, how ultra-processed foods are fine, at least some ultra-processed foods are fine. And I would agree with that because there are some ultra-processed foods that do quite well on the satiety per calorie scale. Even if, on average, they do right. garbage bad, uh, there are exceptions. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this. It, it would even be possible to design ultra-processed foods to be more satiating than whole foods. If that That's, was Yeah, it's possible. But it's not so profitable. That's the problem. The right. problem is that uh, financial incentives are in the other direction, right? Right. The more people eat, the more they buy. Right. So, you want, yeah, you want to keep to keep them eating and not be satiating. Exactly. Keep, keep them eating. Exactly. Incentives. Exactly. Yeah. Keep them eating. Keep them buying. Right. It, it's not that it's a, a structural impossibility or or a, yeah, it's not inherently impossible. It's just that majority of no, it's the opposite. It's super possible. It's uh, super are, possible. It's just uh, it's against their financial interest. Yeah. Because uh, often the ingredients are also more expensive. Right. Protein is more expensive than sugar right. or fat. Right. So I mean, it's, it's it's a bad uh, bad financial deal for for two reasons. You have to pay more for the ingredients, and then people buy less. It's yeah. Like it's a disaster, right? Right. Uh, there is this this kind of puzzling exception, which is you touched on the artificial sweeteners, and so there are some tr some of these trials that show that people eat, drinking diet soda it, it helps them lose weight. Sometimes even compared to water. Yeah, Not I know. I tend to, I mean, from this theory, from this sort of satiety per calorie framework, then you would predict that artificially sweetened beverages are fine. But uh, if you put artificial sweeteners in a caloric food, then it might bump up the hedonic mm. factor and make you eat more. So, for example, baked goods with a lot of fat in it, and then you add artificial sweeteners. Well, now you eat even more of, of it because it's tastier. Right. And you get even more empty calories, even mm -hmm. though it's not calories from the artificial sweeteners, you eat more of other calories. Like a, a low-carb cheesecake, you have uh, replaced flour with almond flour and you replaced the sugar with artificial sweeteners. Right. Now, from a low-carb perspective, it looks, looks all right because there's not a lot of carbs in it. But people certainly eat a lot when they start eating that. It's very tasty. And it's got a ton of fat calories. Yeah, I would expect that not to be very good for weight loss or weight maintenance, but I would expect it to be better than the the original with the with yes, the yes. It would be kind of a damage control to to add, to add sweetness. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, I, I still think artificial sweeteners are are beneficial in, in in that situation as well. It's just not as inert. Like if you're drinking artificially sweetened soda, maybe you can drink a lot then nothing much happens but if you start eating low carb cheesecake right yeah. maybe it's good to stop sometime right the soda is, is probably zero calorie or very low calorie and exactly so, yeah, you're not going to get fat, fat from the soda itself unless it has some other indirect effect of of increasing appetite but these trials yeah still... but the studies doesn't seem to support that right yeah i agree with that these four factors also seem to be independent from each other, right? Because we can think of diets and we can certainly anecdotally, we can think of cases or people who say that they are satiated on diets that don't seem to uh, check at least some of these boxes, but as long as they oh, check yeah, sure. the others. Exactly. Yeah. Like a, a vegan diet might be a little bit low in protein for some people, but it's very, very good in energy density, right. and fiber, and probably on hedonic scores as well. 
while a, a, a ketogenic uh, low carb diet might be a little bit weak on the energy density side, but it makes up for it with a very very high strong uh, protein, protein count yeah. and very low on hedonics. Yeah, right. It's not one of these things in, in isolation, not just the protein or not just the energy density, but this this uh, this balance of of all. Yeah. The I mean, that's what's so cool that it can explain why all these diets work, while while the conventional explanations of these diets they can only explain why they work, not the other ones. Right. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. To be able to see, okay, yeah, you can do it like that because X. Sure. I wonder if the the individual variability. So people who say, for example, those individuals who say, "Hey, I went on a whole food low uh, low fat diet and I gained weight," and then some people say, "I went on a, on a keto diet and I and I gained weight." These are unusual, but but they clearly happen. So several some people report that. I wonder mm -hmm. if it's because the these different pillars, the four pillars, hit them differently. So. The person mm -hmm. who doesn't do well on the high fiber, low protein diet, maybe they need a stronger protein lever and the fiber isn't as strong for them, mm -hmm. vice versa for the guy who doesn't do well on low carb. Yeah, they could be exactly like that. Or uh, another complementary thing could be that, um, for example, on a, <clears throat> on a low carb diet, if you overdo the added fat, component and underdo the protein and you, you go to a little bit more highly refined processed high fat uh, foods uh, that are still low carb then you might not do so well mm -hmm. like if you go all in on low carb baked products or right. fat bombs or you know butter and olive oil in yeah. large quantities on top of everything yeah. Okay, you're low carb, but maybe this type of calorie actually didn't get so high, right? Right. right. And and like you were uh, touching on on the on the uh, whole food uh, uh, plant based diet, maybe if you go a little bit too low in protein and maybe add a little bit too much, you know, slightly refined carbohydrates, perhaps. Um, yeah, yeah, might not be so great. Yeah, the energy density might might be shot. Yeah, or like uh, uh, vegan des vegan desserts. Uh, uh -huh. Add a bunch of those. Right, trying to game the system by doing the exactly. vegan or, or, the, or the, the keto diet with these all these processed foods. Exactly, <laughs> you're going to be hard to. They're trying to game the system with with lots of uh, hedonic, ultra processed, uh, special products, and then uh, that's are off. So just to summarize real quick, the four pillars of satiety are protein percentage, energy density, hyperpalatability, and fiber. And they seem to work independently, so you don't have to maximize all four for a food to be very satiating, but you do need to hit at least a couple. Some of the most satiating foods per calorie include egg whites, leafy greens, Greek yogurt, and mushrooms. Whereas foods that rank pretty low include salted nuts, dried fruit, candy, and snacks like potato chips or french fries. These four pillars of satiety can be adapted to all kinds of personal preferences, so lower carb, lower fat, vegan diets, etc. can all be designed in a satiating way. Here's more on protein sources and how much protein we actually need, and here's more on how to put together the healthiest possible diet for humans. Check those out. I'll meet you over there. Bye-bye.